So the idea here is if we can guarantee that there's no dependence between the instructions, we can think about having, you can execute those instructions in parallel. And one really good way to have guaranteed independence is to have completely different programs or completely different threads. And the naive approach here is we interleave instructions from different threads to cover latency. So we send a load out here. And while this load is off resolving in the memory system, this is our thread one that we had here before. We did a load in R1, and then we went to go use the result here, also from thread one. Well, by the time the data comes back from memory, we know it's all, all ready to go. We put other work in our processor pipeline. And this is called multi-threading. Now, one of the big insights here is you need to have enough other work to do. And these other threads add some complexity to your processor design. And they may cause some locality challenges. So if you have, if you're trying to exploit temporal locality in, let's say, a cache or a translation look aside buffer or some other buffer, and you start putting other data accesses sort of in the middle here or other operations in the middle, this might destroy your locality. But if let's think about this in a happy, uh, happy way for right now. If you can find other work to do, you can just shove it in uh, uh, the slots while you're, while you're waiting for this load to come back. The most basic version of multi-threading is going to be some sort of very basic interleaving. So we run thread one, then thread two, then thread three, then thread four, thread one, thread two, thread three, and thread four. So we don't pay attention to the uh, latencies or dependencies of the instructions when we go to schedule. And if you come around to a thread slot and there is nothing to do, let's say this load missed in a cache and took 1,000 cycles to come back, you just don't schedule anything. You have a dead cycle there. One of the nice things about multi-threading that you can take advantage of is that you don't have to worry about bypassing anymore. Because if you know that you're not going to be executing an instruction from the same thread until a couple cycles later, why do you need to have a fast bypass from the ALU back to itself? You just don't care. So you, let's see, do we actually have an example of that? So here's, here's an example of this, that you have a, a write to R1 and then a read of R1. What value does this thread to get here? So the, the first versions of multi-threading machines tried to partition the register file so that this wouldn't happen. So you compile up your programs differently. That's not really common anymore. Um, we'll, we'll talk about an example of where they actually did that. The, for instance, the, uh, that was actually also a uh, limiter to threads for a while uh, until sort of people came up with the idea of what you just suggested, which is somehow change the namespace of the registers. And the way that that was actually changed was um, well, the first implementation we'll talk about in a little bit, but the first implementation was on Spark, actually, and they used the register windows on Spark, which gave you different namespaces for different registers. And that, then that finally evolved into actually having a thread identifier and having copies of the entire register space. So each thread had a different register set. And that's what we're going to show in this picture here. So as, as shown here, you have to copy the general purpose register file four times. <clears throat> and you have to copy the program counter four times. And then you have a incrementer out here in the front of the pipe, which chooses the thread ID or the thread select. And in our simple case here, we're just going to keep incrementing this and choose one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and just uh, uh, continually does that. And likewise, that's an index into which general purpose register file we're supposed to be accessing. Or which logical general purpose register file. Because most of these architectures 
we'll actually put this together in one larger general purpose register file and then have uh, this just be some addressing bits that are architecturally not, uh, uh, not visible. But you bring up a good, uh, good point that um, there are a couple user land threading libraries out there. So um, it introduces this notion of threading, but not on a multi-threaded computer architecture. So where you don't have this and this. And there's still some advantages to that, because you still uh, can swap between different threads and actually try to cover memory latency, because your load to use will be longer. And those threading libraries, uh, largely, they do try to partition the register file space still. So you can actually go download one of these um, on you know, Linux and go run it. And people still use these threading libraries to go do that, the user land thread libraries. The other way to go do that is actually to swap out the entire register space. But people typically try not to do that, because that, if you're trying to do fine grain interleaving and you want to save your entire register space to memory, that's, that's very expensive. But the, the, these threading libraries sort of work together with the compiler and tell the compiler, don't, don't use all the registers for thread one. Use half the registers for thread one and half the registers, let's say, for thread two. So this is our simple multi-threading pipeline. It's relatively small changes so far. Um, replicate the register file, replicate the PC, and this can help us recover utilization on our ALU, for instance. And one thing I wanted to point out that to software, what this looks like is it looks like multiple processors. So if you go use something like a modern day Core i7, those have two th hardware threads. But when you go to look at it, it'll look like there's twice as many cores in the machine than you think there are. So for instance, if you have a four core Core i7 and you open in Windows the little uh, C, uh, process management sort of dialog box, you'll see that there's eight little bars in there because there's one thread or one virtual processor, or excuse me, two virtual processors per physical core in the machine. So they actually look like there's multiple slower CPUs. OK, so what are the costs? The easy costs are replicating the program counter and the general purpose registers. Things that start to become harder to replicate, but you're going to have to replicate also, is if you want to do full uh, isolation of these CPUs is you're going to have to have replication of system state. So things like page tables, things like page table base registers, all the different uh, system state about where the interrupt handler is, so things like the exceptional PC. And this actually gets a little bit uh, hard to do. And some processors have a fair amount of system states. So if you look at x86, there's a lot of system state. MIPS is relatively minimal because they're sort of exceptional PC and the interrupt mask register. Um, but it can be hard, and because the, the TLB software maintains, so you don't even have one of these. Uh, you don't even have a virtual memory page table base register. So this is uh, something to think about, is that you have to replicate all this state per thread. So there's some cost to it. But you still get to hide latencies to memory. You still get to reuse ALUs and increase the efficiency of your ALUs. Personally, I think these are the smaller, smaller things. So this is very small. This is smaller. It's bigger than the first one, but harder to do. The big things out there are when you start to have temporal locality conflicts and spatial locality conflicts. So if you have four threads that are all executing, and they're fighting for space or fighting for capacity in your cache, this can be a problem. Or let's say you have 16 hardware threads and you have an eight-way set associative cache. And they always want to access, let's say, index zero in the cache. This is that common thing. Your stack always starts there or something like that. Well, you only have eight-way associativity. And if you're time multiplexing, 
thread 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and then you loop back around to 1, you're guaranteed that by the time you come back to 1, because you only have an eight-way set associative cache, that you've bumped out the data that you needed so you get no temporal locality. By the time you come back, it's not in your cache. So you had a uh, conflict. You'll have a conflict miss going on there in your cache. OK, so, so this is the negative side, is that they can conflict with each other. But if two threads are working together, you can actually get positive cache interference or, or uh, positive interference or uh, constructive interference in the cache. And that definitely happens. And that was actually uh, one of the reasons that people originally did this multi-threading was that if you have a program where you have different threads that are working on roughly the same data, this is actually very, very good because they'll be prefetching data for each other. <clears throat> but you have to make sure it's a, it's, a, it's a fine line to sort of walk there that when do the threads fight for shared resources and when do they uh, collaborate on pulling in the shared resources and exploit the locality structures in the processor. So the, the cache is one example. Another example is translation look inside buffer entries. One solution to this is you can actually partition the cache or partition the TLB. And then you can guarantee that you do not fight. Unfortunately, if you go to do this and you have a fixed size cache, you effectively cut the cache, let's say, in half or however many threads by n, by n threads. So typically, people don't try to statically partition these things. Um, but you could think about doing that if you want no interference between the different threads. OK, so let's, let's look at a couple different ways that you can try to schedule threads. And they've gone from. Simple to a little more complicated to even more complicated over time. So simple is what we've been talking about up to this point, is that there is some fixed interleaving of n hardware threads, and you basically execute one instruction from each thread and then change to the next thread. So that was the, our first case. So this is a fixed interleaving, um, dates back to the, the 60s. And this is pretty simple. What's nice about this is you can remove some of the interlocking and some of the bypassing from your processor. Next thing you can think about is, well, you can try to allocate different locations in your scheduling quantum to different threads. So for instance, we know that the cyan thread here is the highest priority thread and needs the most number of slots. So we can do an uneven distribution. And we can say, over our slots here, we can actually interleave and say, well, the cyan thread gets every other one, we'll say. And then we can say, let's say the orange one gets a smaller percentage and the blue one gets a smaller percentage. So it's a Still a fixed interleaving to some extent, or fixed ordering, but it is uh, controllable by software depending, or the operating system, depending on the priorities of the different threads. So it's a little bit more flexible in hardware than the completely fixed interleave uh, design. And, and this does require a little bit of change here, because you can't just have this counter here just sort of incrementing your thread ID. Instead, you need to have something else here, which sort of is a, is a picker for which thread to go execute. But still relatively simple. And because it's software programmable, you can actually choose a time and then reallocate. So the OS can change the allocation for a different time here. And let's say, make orange a uh, higher priority instead of the cyan. Then we start to go something a little more complicated. So this is still relatively fixed priorities. You can think about something where you actually have the hardware making decisions about which one to go execute. And you could actually even have it go as far as, let's say, determining if you're executing a thread, which then 
has a long latency operation, it'll switch to another thread at that point. So it'll try to fill in backfill work from other threads purposely when one thread gets swapped out. Or one thread thread goes to do something that's a long latency operation. And you can think about uh, designs like that. And that is something like uh, the HEP processor, which we'll be talking about in a minute or two. Uh, uh, has, is, is, was one of the first early examples of that. So just to recap here, we're going to call this coarse grain multi-threading. The reason we're calling it coarse grain is because for any one cycle, only one thread is running. And you might scratch your head and say, how do you have multiple threads running in one, one cycle? Well, we'll show, if you go to a superscalar, or multi-issue processor, you could think about having the different pipelines executing instructions from different threads simultaneously. That's called simultaneous multi-threading, and we'll talk about that in a second. <clears throat> but in our coarse grain approach here, just to, to recap, you can swap threads on hardware misses, <clears throat> and you can take advantage of bubbles in the processor to do other work. OK, so a little bit of a history lesson here. Um, the HEP processor was uh, Burton Smith, who's now at Microsoft Research. Uh, he was the, the, the chief architect of this uh, back in the 80s. And this processor is actually pretty interesting because there was lots and lots of threads and a small number of processors. So there was 120 threads in this machine per processor. Relatively modest clock rate for the 80s. Um, but what they were trying to do here is they were trying to deal with memory latency. So this machine had a very high bandwidth memory system. And what would happen is Effectively, you were allowed to have a load or store every instruction, and your performance would never degrade if you had a load and a store every instruction. Because in this machine, they had 120 threads per processor, and the memory latency was less than 120 cycles. So if you had a load every instruction, and you have enough bandwidth to be able to uh, feed all those loads, you could execute a load from each different thread, and there are none of them are, uh, each thread was independent of each other. You could basically go out to the memory system, wait the latency, have it come back, and pipeline the, the latency out to memory, and pipeline the memory access. And by the time you were to come back and execute the next instruction from that thread, which would be like 120 cycles later, the memory result would be there. So this insight was carried forward. Uh, Burden went and started this company called Terra or Terra Systems, which later went on to buy Cray, strangely enough. Because um, I always thought Cray was a bigger company than Terra, and it definitely was. But we'll call it a merger, but I think that's what they called it. But uh, in reality, Terra acquired Cray. And Terra had a similar sort of idea here. More processors, this was a sort of Further evolution of the HEP processor, 128 active threads per processor, lots of processors, 256 processors, so lots of active programs. So you had to find enough thread level parallelism in your, in your program. And this architecture has no, no caches because they don't need it. If you have enough bandwidth out to your memory system, you can have a load every cycle. And you can cover the latency with other threads. Why do you, why do you care? So some, some interesting things about this is this may not be good for power. You are not exploiting locality in your data references at all. And you're going out to the memory system every cycle. And that could be far away. And it is, was far away in this machine. So that's you got to be a little careful about these uh, machines. And then the second idea here is you have to come up with lots of threads. Now, we're talking about having similar numbers of threads in something like modern day many core machines. But there's still a fair number of threads to be able to effectively use the machine 
uh, to, its, to its best performance. I wanted to say about this, actually, this architecture, where it got mostly used was in applications that had no locality anyway, or no temporal or spatial locality in their data references anyway. And good examples of this were things like data mining, huge data sets, arbitrary access to the data sets. Not, you couldn't have a prefetcher predict where your next memory reference was going to be. So if you were just going basically not going to be able to effectively fit in a cache or use a cache anyway, remove the cache and go, go multi-threaded was the idea behind these machines. And they actually uh, saw some uh, uh, big speed ups for applications that had, had data sets like that. This still actually lives on today um, in the Cray XMT, the extreme multi threaded architecture. And uh, you can go buy this machine from what's nowadays called Cray Computer Corp, which was Terra eating Cray or buying Cray. And uh, it's mod modest clock speed by mo uh, modern day standards. It's only 500 megahertz, but it, they can intermix these with sort of opterons and other processors uh, because they standardized on the AMD bus protocol. So you can plug in AMD chips and these uh, XMT chips in the same system. Just a uh, recap here of like what their memory system looked like. Their instruction pipelines were very long, and they didn't have to bypass because you could never execute instruction and a subsequent instruction which would use the results. And the memory operations, the memory latencies, uh, were about 150 cycles, and they had 128 threads. So the probability, they, they were typically not waiting for the memory system, um, and they could effectively pipeline their memory operations. Another little tidbit of history here. So this is the machine I was talking about that uh, is my academic lineage a little bit here. Um, when I first showed up at MIT, there was this machine in the corner called the MIT L-Wave processor, which was a multi-processor machine. It went up to 128 nodes, which was a lot at, in 1990. And one of the, the little tidbits about this machine is they had Spark processors, and a Spark processor had this notion of a register window. What a register window is, is every time you do a system call, uh, you basically change your addressing into the register file. So there's a larger register file, and you have a smaller window onto the register file, and you kind of slide this window across the register file on function calls and function returns. <clears throat> And the MIT Outwife processor used this, uh, and they extended this register window idea such that they could have a special instruction which would actually change how much of the register file they were looking at at a time, so, so they could actually swap the entire register file very quickly. And this actually allowed them to multi-thread uh, very effectively with four threads. And this was one of the uh, early multi-threaded processors, and they introduced this notion of thread switch on remote memory access. So if you had a memory access that had to go to one of the other nodes in this machine, so if you were on this node here and you had to go down to this one and you had to send a message over there in a multiprocessor uh, notion, you actually had to send a message and get a response back. It took a long time. So you would actually switch threads at that time. Multi-threading lives on today, um, especially this, and this coarse grain multi-threading lives on today. A good example of this is the Oracle and what used to be Sun, and before that, Afara Niagara processors. Afara was the name of the uh, startup company that made this, and then Sun acquired them, and then Oracle acquired Sun. And the Sun Niagara processors was designed for throughput computing, such that you can have lots of uh, threads running, and they were all independent, and it was a multi-threaded processor. So the Niagara 1 had eight cores, and then four threads per core, and they've 
turn that up over time. So nowadays, the Niagara 3, so this is what was called the, the Sun T1. This was the Sun T2, and this is the Sun T3 now. Uh, they have 16 cores where they have eight threads per core. So a lot of parallelism going on here. And this core screen multi-threading uh, uh, goes on. So here's our uh, die photo of the Niagara 3 processor. You can see the different cores. Um, you might look in this picture and say, there's what looks to be 16 cores. And I say 16 cores on this slide here, but one of the interesting things is they actually sort of conjoin two cores together internally. Um, it's just a strange sort of design idea that they do is that they, they mix the threads and the cores together and they share, I think it was a, a floating point unit between the two cores. So these two cores are to some extent conjoined cores together. 